everybody. This is a video that just gives you guys a brief overview of the process of developing a behavior support plan. So for this video, our objectives and our agenda are going to be pretty much the same. So we're going to go through the process of um, creating a behavior support plan. We're going to talk about the three different strategies, the three different functional assessments of behavior, um, which are informal, descriptive, and experimental. And when we talk about these, um, I'm going to talk about the differences between the three. And then we're going to talk about how the intervention that you guys choose relates to the function-based assessment. So the first step in developing a behavior support plan is to identify the challenging behavior. So if you as a teacher decide that there's a learner that's engaging in a challenging behavior, you're going to do what we talked about so far in this class. So you're going to identify it, you're going to define the challenging behavior, you're going to measure it, you're going to collect data on it, and you're going to graph your data, and that's going to be your baseline data. And that's going to tell you, okay, is this a challenging behavior that I need to address? Because you're going to have a nice graph and you're going to be able to see how often um, the challenging behavior is occurring. Um, us as teachers, we have so many things going on. And we're also human, so our recall isn't always as accurate as we want it to be. So if you just go off the top of your head and you think about the challenging behavior, um, when it's occurring and how often it's occurring, a lot of times um, just going from memory might not be really accurate. So that's when you really want to get in there. You want to measure it. You want to get your graph. You want to take data on it. And you want to figure out, is this a challenging behavior that I need to address? If you've done that and you decide that you need to address it, then the next, uh, uh, next step in the process is to go through a screening process. So this is when you want to make sure that there's no biological or physical reason as to why the behavior is occurring. If there is a biological or physical reason, then you can fix it without going any further in the process. So for example, um, if you have a kid that's having trouble seeing, um, maybe they need glasses. Or if you have a learner that's having trouble hearing, and that's why they're engaging in problem behavior, um, maybe something like a hearing aid can help. Or it might be something like um, a difference in medication or medication need to be, needs to be altered or something like that. If you go through the screening process and they decide that there's no biological or physical reason as to why the behavior is occurring, then we assume that it's a behavioral problem. So we assume then that the cause of the behavior lies in the environment. And if that's the case, then we need to look at the relationship between the behavior and the environment and we need to figure out what's the function of the behavior, why is the behavior occurring, and that's when you go through your functional assessment. Within a functional assessment, we have three strategies that essentially we can use to figure out the function of the behavior, and I like to look at them on a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the easiest strategy. So it has low level of difficulty, but you also have low level of precision. Um, and so you can't be as competent as competent that you've identified the function at the lowest level. As you move up the pyramid and it becomes closer to the point, the precision increases, but the level of difficulty increases. So let's start at the very bottom. Very bottom, we have indirect assessments. It's, they are indirect assessments because you're not directly observing the behavior. So you're going to gather information about the behavior indirectly. You're going to do interviews with caregivers, um, inter interviews with teachers. You're going to look at previous records on interventions of the challenging behavior or anything like that. And you're going to be able to figure out, you know, hopefully what the behavior looks like, when it's occurring, and maybe hypothesize a function of the behavior. And next, you want to go in and actually directly observe the behavior. And you want to observe what's going on in the environment when the behavior is occurring. So before the behavior occurs and after the behavior occurs. These are called descriptive analyses. So you're observing the behavior and you're describing what's going on um, in the environment and with the behavior. This is also called an ABC analysis. So you'll hear that term as well. Um, so with descriptive analysis, I said higher level of precision than indirect because you are actually going in, object, going in and directly observing the behavior. So after you observe the behavior and you look for patterns within your antecedents and your consequences, you can probably hypothesize a function of the behavior. But it is more difficult than indirect because 
more time consuming, you have to find a time to go in and observe the behavior. Now, if your hypothesis between your indirect assessments and descriptive analyses are consistent and you're confident, you're pretty confident that you have identified the function, then you might be able to move on to the intervention phase. However, if there's any inconsistencies between your hypothesis and your indirect assessments and your hypothesis with your descriptive analyses, then you really want to go up to this last and final level, which is your experimental analysis or conducting what we call a functional analysis. So in a functional analysis, you're actually manipulating variables in the environment and looking at the and evaluating the effects on behavior. Because you're manipulating environment because you're manipulating variables in the environment, you can actually correctly identify the function of the behavior. So since you're not manipulating anything with the descriptive or indirect, they're just hypotheses. But with experimental analysis, since you are manipulating, you can be certain that you have found the function of the behavior. Um, so higher level of present precision, you can find the function, but higher level of difficulty, and that if you move up to this last strategy, you need more resources, more expertise, and things like that. So these are the three strategies for your function-based assessment. And I do want to point out that when we say function-based assessments, we're talking about all the strategies that we use to figure out the function of the behavior. So students oftentimes get function-based assessments confused with functional analyses. A functional analysis is when you actually go in and systematically alter um, variables in the environment, whereas a function-based assessment is um, using different strategies, all of these, to determine the function of the behavior. Okay, so after you've done your functional assessment and you have either determined the function of the behavior through functional analysis or you have a very confident hypothesis of the function of the behavior, then you're going to develop your behavior support plan. So a behavior support plan, also sometimes called a behavior intervention plan or a BIP, is a plan for behavior change that involves those functional assessment strategies. So you take into account what you determined in your functional assessment. From your functional assessment, you should have identified the antecedents that most commonly trigger the behavior. You should have identified the problem behavior and you should have identified the maintaining consequence. So what's the function of the behavior? What's maintaining the behavior? You also might have looked at what we call setting events. So setting events are a little different from antecedents. Remember, antecedents occur are environmental variables that environmental stimuli that occur right before the behavior occurs. But setting events typically occur way before the antecedents, and they um, set the occasion for the antecedent to be more likely to trigger the problem behavior. So for example, this is something like, um, maybe the kid is sick or doesn't feel good. And when they're sick and the teacher gives a direction, like in this example, so the antecedent was, is when given a direction and the problem behavior is disruptive behavior. So if the kid is sick, then the teacher providing the antecedent or their instruction is more likely to trigger the disruptive behavior. As opposed to if the kid feels great, the teacher may give the instruction and the kid may or may not engage in the disruptive behavior. Another setting event could be something like the kid um, or the learner got in a fight with a friend before coming to class. And then when the teacher provides instruction, that setting event makes it more likely for that instruction to trigger the disruptive behavior. After all these, um, from your function-based assessment, you should have had a, a hypothesis of the function of the problem behavior or the target behavior, or if you did a functional analysis, then you will know the function of the challenging or target behavior. And then you want to talk about the procedures for behavior change and support. So your main goal in a behavior support plan is to reduce a challenging behavior and increase a more appropriate behavior. So let's take this example. We have our antecedent, which is the teacher gives a direction. Our problem behavior, say it's throwing a pencil. And then our maintaining consequence is that the kid throws the pencil and he gets a break or he gets to escape from the task. So like I said, our goal is to replace our inappropriate behavior with an appropriate behavior. Um, and I wanna add that it wants 
it needs to serve the same function. So this is what's called a functional intervention. And that's why figuring out the function of the behavior is so important because the child wants whatever is the maintaining consequence. Um, in this example, they want a break and you want them to be able to have a break, but just you want them to be able to have a break for engaging in appropriate behavior, not an inappropriate behavior. So you're going to figure out an alternate behavior. So maybe an acceptable alternate behavior is asking for a timeout or asking for a few minutes. So you're going to basically replace throwing the pencil with this alternate acceptable behavior, asking for a few minutes. Um, and therefore, the kid, it serves the same function. It just is a more appropriate behavior. All right, so in this video, we talked about the process of developing a behavior support plan identifying the problem behavior, going through the screening process, going through the function-based assessments, um, and we had three of them, indirect, descriptive, and functional analyses, and then talking about, you know, the goal of the behavior support, behavior support plan and what you're typically trying to do with the intervention. All right, guys, if you have any problems, uh, please let me know. All right, thanks for listening.